Hello everyone. You're really welcome to the alternative to Skullnaglarshach 2020, the festival of early Irish harp which normally takes place each August in Kilkenny in Ireland. Between the 13th and 17th of August 2020, we'll be joining together each day to watch a talk, a workshop and concert footage from previous Skullina. Find out more on our website at irishharp.org. It's day four of our 2020 Alternative Festival. Welcome to today's workshop. So my, my idea for today is that we've done, that this is our session, it's kind of this kind of sad session. It's the end of Scotland and Grouching. We have to go away for a whole year and before the beginning of the next one. We have to manage on our own and inspire ourselves with Party thoughts and musical ideas and insights. And in the past, I've tried to do sessions on like what do we do next, or how do we keep going, or what's the point of it all in a kind of nihilistic way. But today, I thought I had, I had some ideas that kind of pulled together some of the things that we've been working on this week and some of the things we've been thinking about in the past year. Um, and so I'm going to talk about history and tradition and revival as three slightly different things that are kind of related to each other, but they're different. And if we can understand the connections and difference between these different concepts, this can give us a, a deeper and more interesting understanding of who we are and what we're doing with this music and with this amazing art. And so my picture that I've chosen for the, for the cover picture is one of the early revivals of our harp. And you can see these wonderful Victorian people uh, up in Oban for their, for their Gallic choir about 1892. And you have on the far left of the picture is a man with pipes, and on the far right of the picture is a lady with a clatter. And this will be one of the Glen harps that were made in the early 1890s, and they're fairly good copies of the medieval granite uh, harps and they have carved out one piece of willow sound boxes and brass wire strings and they're pretty closely modelled on the Trinity College harp, the Queen Mary harp and the Lamont harp. And this is Scotland? Oban is in, Oban is in the west of Scotland, yes. <coughs> and I, I'm interested in this revival because they really went for it seriously, they commissioned good museum replicas as, as good as what we've got here in the room today and yet they didn't click about the playing style and the touch and the everything so she's playing it back to front on her right side she's got it held quite high on her knees with her hands up so she's basically uh, classically trained on pedal harp and they tried to apply those techniques across and it kind of didn't work and within a year or two that whole thing had been abandoned so, so it was like a, a one or two year revival that just disappeared without trace, and they replaced it with modern design gut string lead harps. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting, but this is like a little poignant thing, and it reminds us that we're not actually on our own here in the grand sweep of things. There's plenty of other people that in other places and other times who've seen what we've seen and, and, and got what we've got and thought we have to try and do this. <coughs> not all of which has been successful, but still. <laughs> so, I had this idea, people often talk about historical harp, and people talk about traditional music, and sometimes you kind of, it gets a bit hazy and you talk about the, the traditional music, traditional musicians playing the historical harps, or in the historical harp tradition, and nobody ever stops and talks about these things, and so I thought, what is history, what is historical, and what is traditional? And so I was thinking that history really means storytelling, that you're here now telling a story to, to somebody about stuff that happened in the past that's not happening now. Do you see what I mean? This is what history means, is, is you're having a conversation about stuff in the past. Does that make sense? But tradition is quite a different thing. Tradition is a thing that's completely happening now, and it's a kind of, when you have a tradition, the people in the tradition 
they have expectations about what you should do. You know, if you if you're in a tradition and you do something that's contrary to what people expect, they think you're doing it wrong, or they're surprised at what you do, or they find it inappropriate. You know, and you can think about this in very broad ways, even little things like when you come to the door and you see somebody for the first time of the day, you say, hello, good morning. And that's the little traditions we have of things that we say when we meet people for the first time or when we leave at the end of the day. And if you say something different, then it's considered a bit strange and inappropriate. If you walk in the door in the morning and say, good night, I mean, literally, it might be true, you might have had a good night. But it's not expected. And it's this, it's this expectation of what should be done. There's a kind of norm. Of this is what's done. This is the norm of what's done. And I also thought that tradition includes these instructions in what to do. So, so you, you <coughs> see other people, or they tell you, this is how you do this thing. And then you get and do that, and then you're part of that tradition. It's handing on. Okay? So, in early Irish harp music, we have history by the bucket load, as Eamon said last year, and we have no tradition. And I find this quite interesting. Okay, we're drowning in history, and we're parched with thirst for tradition. Because as you all know from your studies this week, the old Irish harpers didn't pass the tradition on to students. There was no continuing carrying stream of you know, the Irish harp playing. The, the tradition came to an end in the 19th century, and that was it. And the, and the replacement traditions that, that filled the void of harping in Ireland, the guts from the lever harp, was a new imported tradition that didn't have any continuity or contact with the old tradition of the early Irish harp, as far as we know. Okay. So this is kind of interesting, that what we're interested in, the early Irish harp, has no carrying tradition. And some people have seen that and said, well, in that case, it's dead and you can't ever do anything about it, and, and we'll just lament it and tell stories about it. Okay? But because we have so much history, because we have Bunting's manuscript, because we have the old harps in the museum, because we have the memoirs of Arthur O'Neill, because we have all these stories and documents telling the story, then we have this idea that we don't have to just sit back and say it's dead, what a shame. We can do something about it. Okay? And that doing something about it is the revival. Okay? But I'm going to talk about revival a bit more in a little bit. Let's, let's stick with history and tradition, first of all. Now, one of the things that I've been looking at for a few years now is Welsh harp. Okay? There are interesting connections between Irish harp and Welsh harp. Now, they are quite separate things. The traditions are quite independent, they're connected to language traditions, and Irish and Welsh language are quite independent. They're organologically independent. Irish harp is not used in Wales, Welsh harp is not used in Ireland as a rule. The, the Welsh... Irish harp was used in Wales. I said, I said as, a, as a general rule. As a general you know, rule. Sorry. Na native Welsh harpers don't play Irish harp. They play... Right. Okay? So na what native Welsh harpers have done all through the centuries is they've, is they've looked east and south and they've got their harps in London. And so, and so Welsh harp tradition has used imported Anglo-Continental harps, but they've used it in an indigenous native tradition. And this is the same way that Irish fiddle, Irish, Irish fiddlers get, the, 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 the fiddles that Irish traditional fiddlers play are basically Italian violins. Yeah? Okay, and so the and Irish fiddle makers are copying the Stradivarius models, just the same as classical Ireland makers all over the world. So, so, it's, so it's not a problem that Welsh, harp, Welsh harpists are using Anglo-Continental instruments in their tradition, and it doesn't dilute the genuine, authentic nativeness of their tradition. Okay. Irish harp is different because the Irish harpers had their own indigenous type of harp that doesn't have a great deal in common with the, with the uh, Anglo-Continental so that's the main difference, as far as I can see, between the way these two traditions work. Okay. It's the type of instrument. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, but, but in terms of, and, and, and so the traditions themselves, there's not that much crossover. There is this tradition in, in, the, in the medieval Welsh harp tradition that their traditions come from Ireland, and there's lots of garbled stuff like that. But 
from a kind of anthropological point of view, the way the tradition works seems to me to be very similar in the way you have these the tradition of blind harpers, there's oral tradition learning, there's playing to accompany formal art songs in the native language. Um, the Welsh harpers always play left orientation, just like the Irish harpers. And as opposed to the, to the yeah, the Welsh harpers play on the left, whereas everybody else plays on the right. So, so there's interesting parallels. So reading about the Welsh harp traditions, I kind of saw, saw this very interesting thing. This is from a book by Welsh harpers about their history and their tradition. And you don't have to read this, but what this is, is a kind of family tree. So the book is by Hugh Roberts and Cleo Ribberg. And this is their family tree, not who their parents were, but who their teachers were. Okay. So Hugh Roberts was taught by Cleo. And Cleo had two teachers, <coughs> Idwal Owen and uh, Nancy Richards. Now, Idwal Owen, she, she doesn't tell us who his teachers were, and I think that's kind of interesting. Perhaps she was embarrassed that his partner had this lineage of teachers going right up here to these, uh, to these um, Victorian <coughs> men, and Robert Jones, born around 1795. <coughs> and, and, and two lineages of students that came that Ola Cleo also learned from Frida Holland, and she has this lineage back to Robert Jones as well. But, but I think Cleo's main teacher was Nancy Richards, who was 1889 to 1979. And she learned from Tom Lloyd, and he learned from John Davies, and he learned from Richard Roberts, and he learned from John Parry, the blind harper. The, 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 he's the man who, um, who worked with Hannibal, isn't he? Yes. And he learned from Robert <laughs> Parry. And, um, and he was descended from the medieval harpers, etc. It's lost in the mist of times. But, but they put this as a little appendix to their book on the history of harping in their area of Anglesey. And I thought, how interesting that they're so proud of this, of knowing this lineage. They know who their teacher, 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 teacher was. Okay. And I thought, this, isn't that a wonderful thing? Isn't that wonderful if you were a traditional harpist that you could say, this is my lineage. This is where I come from. This is where my music comes from. And the other thing that they get is harps. Okay, so there's a picture in the book that I'm not going to show you of, um, of Hugh Roberts playing a Grecian pedal harp that was owned by <coughs> Maggie Ann. And so Maggie Ann passed it to, to Doris and to Idwell and, and to Hugh Roberts. And I thought, that's kind of fun that you can inherit your instrument through these generations of lineages. And there's quite a few of these people. I think Leo has uh, Nancy Richards' triple heart, but Nancy didn't have it new. It's one that she inherited from one of her teachers. So the instruments themselves are passed down, and the repertory, and the playing style, and the stories, and all the traditions. as a kind of package. And I thought, I bet the Irish harp is have this. I bet they have this. Okay. And so I thought, well, let's try. <laughs> so this is the longest chain that I was able to put together. Okay. So, so, we, so we know Patrick Byrne, we have his photograph, and we know that Edward McBride was his tutor at the Irish Harp Society School in Belfast, and we know that Edward McBride was a student of Arthur O'Neill at the Irish Harp Society School in Belfast. So both of these, you know, th this is the start of the, of the revival, this is the charitable attempt to keep it going that didn't really go anywhere. So even this is a little bit artificial. And Arthur O'Neill tells us in his memoirs that he was taught by Owen Keenan, who was born in about 1725. But I don't know who, who taught Owen Keenan. I don't know if that information is anywhere. And you could, you could, I'm not sure that you could branch it out that way, because I'm not sure that we know any other teachers of any of these people, but you could certainly branch out this way, because Arthur O'Neill had tons of students at the Harp Society. And one of them was Valentine Rennie, who had tons of students of the same generation as Patrick Bird, and Edward McBride had tons. So you could probably add about 20 more names to that without much effort. But one thing you'll notice is that it stops here. Okay? So, so the Welsh chart stopped with Hugh Roberts, but he's still alive, and he, you, know, you can go on YouTube and find videos of him, and that's fine. But this one stops with Patrick Bird, and he's dead for 150 years or so. 
Okay. And this is our problem, that the lineage has come to an end there, and that's it, that's the end. Okay, they, they, were, they didn't pass the tradition on, so the lineage comes to an end. So it's like a family tree, and you have a name on it and died without issue, and that's the end of that family tree. Okay. And they have no descendants, and you can't make new descendants off of them after a gap, because that's not how the lineages work. And I had a thing, and I thought, what other lineages can we come up with? And I, and I came up with two tiny fragmentary ones, but I suspect that these ones are related because, uh, because we, we know Cornelius Lyons, and we, and we have reference to two students of his, Eckley McCain and Hugh Quinn. Okay. And, we, and we know that Dennis and Hapsey played a lot of Cornelius Lyons' repertory. And so in an oral tradition, there must be some connection between them. You know, the Ennis and Hampson must have learned those variation sets from. Well, they were both in the north of Ireland. Maybe he learned, maybe Dennis Hampson, maybe there should be a dotted line that goes up to Cornelius Lyons. Dennis, we don't know that Dennis Hampson met him, but he might have done. But, not that far away. Yeah. But you see what I mean? There must, be some, there must be some dotted line that goes from Lyons through somebody else, maybe to Dennis and Hampson. So, so there's a kind of theoretical connection there, possibly. But I don't know. And then Dennis Hampton tells us about his four tutors, but we don't know who taught them. And Dennis Hampton didn't have any students, as far as we know, so his lineage ends there. And there's that story in The Wild Irish Girl that when Dennis Hampton was in Scotland in probably in 1745, maybe, or one of his other earlier trips in the 1730s, and he went to a castle and they had a harp. And the, the, the master of the castle was an oldish man, and there was a young son, and he said, Dennis, will you come back when our young son is old enough when he's a teenager and teach him to play the harp? But Dennis never did go back. So there could have been another. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. there also, the, the fragment of the Wild Barrier Girl has uh, the man who visits the house, he asks him to teach his daughter. And oh, when he's very old. Yes, yes, when he's very old. Because she, it's too hard for her. Yes, yeah. So, but the point is, is that the lineage has come to an end, and, and I've deliberately written lines above to show there is somebody there, but we don't know who it is, and there's no line below because we know that there's nobody below them, and that's the end. That's the end of their lineage. Patrick Byrne is communicating via letters with a, a man, an Irishman, who yeah. was playing the harp and playing the yeah. key, so he was communicating with other oh, yes. letters. Well, um, there's, there's, a, there's a question here then about how you create these lineages. And so the Welsh lineage is awfully neat. Okay. But of course, traditional musicians play with each other all the time and learn tunes from each other. And so what's the lineage giving us? It's not necessarily that I got a tune from this person. I think what Leo and Hugh mean by their lineage is this person was my teacher for a sustained period of time and they gave me their tradition. They didn't give me a tune or workshop on yeah. bass hand technique, they gave me their tradition and their harp and their stories and I lived in their house for a few years and, you know, this is, this I think. And so, and, so, and so, of course, you know, you have these people with more than one teacher and you think, well, who was their main teacher? Was they shared an equally with one teacher just for a year. And so, so it's not like a proper family tree with genealogy where you have in Charles, theory, Charles, <laughs> Charles with young Charles O'Connor. Yes, like another little tiny. Yes, yes. you can get you yeah. can get two stage ones fairly easily. But I was looking for uh, any longer. Well, I was looking this. I was thinking how long can we get? I got four. But I bet that we can do better than this. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a research project. So I, I've only really been thinking about this for a couple of months. I just suddenly thought, let's do lineages for this presentation. So I bet we can do longer, so this is a challenge for you over the next few years, to find longer lineages and start building family trees and start connecting as many people as you can. And like I said, it's like doing a jigsaw. If you can fit two pieces together, that's good, put them aside, put two more, and then suddenly you might find a connection that joins things together into clumps. Okay, and we'll gradually build up this picture of how all the old Irish harpers that we know about are related to each other. But my main point with those lineages for today, well, no, there's lots of main points, but one of, one of my points, the point I'm going to carry on with, let's say, is that they come to an end, and that's it, and the end is in the 19th century, and that's well over 100 years old, okay? 
So we're faced with a situation where we have an enormous amount of history. It's fascinating. It's beautiful. We have the hearts. We have the manuscripts. We have the stories. We have the portraits. And the tradition is dead for over 100 years. Okay? And so what we're doing then is we say, well, that's okay. Let's do it anyway. And so, and so, so we have the idea of the revival. Okay? Now, revivals are very interesting. And they've been going on in music and in wide, wider culture for quite a long time. Um, you can argue that they're, that they're in a really deep part of Western culture going back centuries, that this idea of, of looking to the past and reviving old stuff. You, know, you can see the whole of Baroque music as a revival of the idea of classical music. Okay? And, the, and when people do revivals, it itself is a part of a wider tradition. And this is the thing we always have to remember, is that everything that we're doing here, and the Irish harp tradition might have stopped, but Western civilization hasn't stopped, and we're part of it, and it's our tradition, and, it's, and we're acting within it without even being aware of it. So there are cultural currents affecting what we do without us realizing it. And then I think, well, let's try and realize, and that'll give us more of an insight as to what we're doing, and what we can do, and what we could do, and what we should do. So the idea of revival, and when you revive something, you have this... You start with the story, you start with the history. This is what it used to be, and now it's not. And then you say, but we could do it again. Okay? And I think what the thing that's interesting is, what do you mean by it? What do you want to do again? Okay? There's a historiographical thing that... I think, I think there's three completely separate things. There's what did people actually do in the past? Okay. What did they actually do? Imagine, imagine Dennis Hapsey sitting in his cottage with a downhill heart playing a tune. He actually did that. He actually did. He actually moved his finger onto a certain string with a certain amount of expression, with a certain feeling and emotion inside himself, and, and, and there was a certain response from the listener. Yeah? It actually happened. What what do we know about that? Or what can we know about it? You know, we can't know everything. We can't know what was in his head about what was going to, was going to happen to dinner that evening, whether that fit to his brain or not. So there's stuff that we can't know about it. We can't know exactly how he moved his hand. In fact, we can know pretty little, you know? We've got scribbled transcripts of the tunes, and then we've got all the ancillary information you know about the portrait, the heart, the wear marks on the heart. Stories, but you see what I mean? There's a, there's a gap between what actually happened and what we know. And there's a big gap between what we know and what we do now. Because now we can do anything. You know, we could run away to the States and join a jazz band and play the banjo. And it wouldn't actually affect what we know about Dennis and Hamsey, and it wouldn't affect what he did. Do you see what I mean about this disconnect? So, so th this is an interesting thing about revival, is that revival is what we do now, and, it, and there's no necessary connection between what we know about what happened in the past and what actually happened about in the past. Okay? We, can, we can claim to be doing exactly what Dennis Hampstead did. Okay? I, I can say to you, this is exactly this building is, Dennis, is where Dennis Hampstead's cottage was. Okay? This legal heart is actually Dennis Hampstead's heart. The one in, the, the one in Guinness is, is, not, is, is, is not really, it's a substitute. Okay? And this tune I'm playing is exactly the thing that he used. And you would all go, this is completely wrong. Okay, but I can say it and I can do it. And how do you know it's wrong? Because you know the history as well as I. And so you can identify. What about the things you don't know? Okay. So, the, 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 what, what about the things you don't know? You know like I say, this is, this is what Dennis Hampton played. Yeah. I might be more cautious, and I might say, well, I don't know exactly what Dennis Hampshire sounded like. I don't know exactly how he held his hand. I don't know exactly how high his seat was. Okay. But this is kind of how it worked. And then once you get into kind of how it works, there's different kinds of kind of. And you can be more or less, you know, you can push it. You can say, well... The law was about. Yeah. You can say, well... This is how Hugh Higgins plays, but we don't know what Hugh Higgins' harp was like. Well, we'll use somebody else's harp. And it's near enough, it's kind of right. You can do, and um, 
you can probably play with the tips of his fingers, but we don't know that, but we'll play with our nails anyway, and it's near enough. And, and then we get to the stage where we're kind of approximating the tradition, except we kind of know that some bits are different, but also we don't really have a way not to. You know, you can't do Arthur and Neil's music on Arthur and Neil's harp because you don't really know what Arthur and Neil's harp was. Do you see what I mean? You have to start making it up. And this is, this is where I think it gets really interesting in terms of what you do when you make it up. And this is, this, this is what informs my whole attempt to get a big picture, to study as much as possible, to try and understand the context of what you're doing. Because then you can kind of say, well, yes, this is plausible. And how do you know it's plausible? I mean, you know, you know certain things and you don't know other things. But you get an idea, you get a sense for the wider cultural context, and then certain things seem to fit the context, and other things seem not to fit the context. But it's very difficult to just say how that's done. Mm. And I think that's connected to the kind of stuff Ronan's talking about, the tradition. How do you how do you know when it, what the grace note is appropriate? Because you just you just know the context, you know the tradition. And then, and then you think, well, in that sense, what we're doing here is making a new tradition. Because there's a communal knowledge, a communal body of experience, there's an expectation amongst us as to, what, as to whether what I'm doing is appropriate or inappropriate to our tradition. But our tradition is not the early Irish harp tradition, because that died over 100 years ago. It's the revival. It's the early Irish harp revival tradition. And we might be all barking up the wrong tree. From the April Fool's joke, where, where a decade or so ago, oh, where, where, yes. I, where, where, I, where I published a spoof paper about how they discovered that they, that they didn't actually use wires, that it was a kind of technical error, and it was gut strings drawn through things to plasticize them or something, and how the, the nearest modern substitute was nylon, and Siobhan believed me. No, it wasn't me, it was a very, it was a, a house to America from where I was, and who, who so and it caused a big kerfuffle. She started frothing yes. about it. But you see, but you see, a piece of information could come up like that yeah, that changes all our opinions. Okay. So Karen Lewis is, is trying to have the the, the uh, medieval house radio carbon dated. Suppose the dates all came back and they were unambiguously 19th century. <laughs> okay. And you all laugh nervously because it's really possible. And then we have to start step back and say, okay, what do we do now? Okay. Or suppose the dates came back and they were unambiguously fifth century. <laughs> okay, which is possible. We, we just don't know, <laughs> and it would completely change a <laughs> view of things. Okay? <laughs> yeah, sure. And you say rather fifth than nineteen because we all have expectations yes. and hopes. Yes. Okay, yeah. we're not doing this in a cool way. What do we know? What do we not know? How does this affect our practice? No, we're we're emotional human beings, and we have we we want certain things, we don't want other things. And this is interesting as well because when you've got so much uncertainty these hopes and fears can colour your practice. Okay. And this is a thing that I'm quite interested in, that, we, that I think we, can be, we should be aware of that. Because if we're to be true to the tradition, to the old tradition that died over 100 years ago, then we have to be careful that our 21st century hopes and fears don't, let, don't lead us to push it in a way that is not what the tradition we're claiming to revive would have wanted. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. This thing about respecting the old tradition that I find very interesting. Anyway, just to finish off, I wanted to talk a little bit about context. So I talk about cultural context. And um, I think one of the things that we talk least about is the context of our music. Okay? We play in classes, we play in the pub, we play in rather formal concerts, sitting on a stage with the audience in lines and clapping at the end of the tune. And I think that's a very 21st century thing, and it's not the cultural context of the old harpers. And I'm not saying that they shouldn't do it, because there's not a connection between what we do now and what happened in the past. It's up to us to choose to do what we do now. But it's, a, it's another piece of the jigsaw to add in, because it might affect things. It's, it's, it adds to our knowledge, it adds to the story. And we, we can't, we, if we want to, we can choose to be influenced by it in our current practice. And if we don't want to, we don't have to, because we can do whatever we like. 
But I just thought we should think of it. You have to be careful about how you interpret Well, of course you have to be careful. I, I'm not interpreting it at all. I'm just putting it up labeled performance context. So it doesn't even look at Sylvia showed us this one. And, and this one fascinates me. Because at, at every concert that we've had here, and the four concerts in this room, okay, the person whose name is shown is the person sitting on the stage. Okay? They're, they're raised up. The lights are on at this end so you can see them. And everybody else sits in rows, not looking at each other, but looking at this person. Yes? Now look at this picture from the late 18th century. Okay? And this is a performance context of the late 18th century Irish harp tradition. And Sylvia showed you the watercolour cartoon of this oil painting, which has a poem which names each of the people. So we have the bishop. Is the bishop the one with the papers? I think so. And, and all his literary and artistic aristocratic friends around him, each one named, and we know who they are because we can look them up in the genealogies and the who's who, except this one here is not named, and he's the only one that's dark, his face isn't coloured in, whether it's because it's been obliterated or whatever, and he's, the, he's just called the Irish Harper. So you have a Harper, but you're not interested in seeing his face, and you're not interested in knowing his name. He just strums away in the background, and I bet they didn't listen in silence and clap at the end of his performance because they're chatting about their literary and artistic friends. Okay? And so then you think, well, that's nice, but I don't think that's how we want to organise our concerts and charge people <laughs> to come in, to have the harper sitting in the corner in the dark and not tell them who it is. Okay? I don't think that's how we want to Yeah, but that it. happens all the but time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Every harpist yeah. is constantly okay. sitting well, in the corner. It's interesting, so the way I do this year come and drink some nibbles was to relax things up because over the last six months or a year, every time I do a concert when I look out at the audience, whether it's in like an opera house or a concert, I think, this is nuts. This yeah. is not the way music ever was, and I don't like it. And so my idea this year with the, with the nibbles and drinks was that everybody would bring their drinks to their seat and it would be one for us there. And I looked down the other at the first concert, everybody had their drinks down the back, and then they'd been all good. Yeah. Put them down and come sat their seats. Oh, well, that's not what well, This, this is what I said about how, we, how all of us live in the tradition of, the, the living tradition of Western culture. The, all those people have expectations yes. about how you behave at a concert, so and they came year, along and did it. So next year, you, the stu you, the students, to bring your drinks to your chairs and look relaxed. So I so want my chair. Yeah. Yeah. So that the public feel behind me. But you see, this is great, because, yeah. because here we are responding to that. And, yeah. and, and it did make a difference. You know, the concert was still working on that. He invited people to go to the Ryan's. Well, yeah. but I think it still didn't work, did it? Yeah, but I think when you have chairs set up like this, it's going to be different. Well, maybe chairs and maybe maybe chairs and tables more cabaret style. I'm serious about that. Yeah, and now the only problem with that is that very hard to it, people want to listen. And, and yes. when you when you set up a, something informal like that, there's going to be somebody yeah. at the top because they'll feel so. There's no necessary connection between what people did in the past and what we do now. Mm. It's up to you, and so. I'm, I'm just I'm just throwing out bits of the story here, and then we can respond to it in what we want. So, so I, I read a very interesting folklore theory thing from, from Alan Dundas, and he said that there's three things in folk music. I don't know I don't know what he meant by folk music. I don't want to go into it now. He said he, he, and he said in a rather cheesy way, text, texture, and context. And what he meant was. What you play, what is the tune, what is the repertory. The texture is how you play it, style, the, the mm -hmm. instrument, the technique, the, the sound quality, you know, all those things, the phrasing, this kind of thing. And where you play it, who's listening, what the building is, how everyone behaves around you. And I thought that's very interesting that he gives these three things equal weight. Mm -hmm. You know, the actual tune, the style and the instrument and everything and what's going on, what, what's going on around you, and what everyone else is doing. And I thought it was very interesting. I think that's the thing that we're not paying attention to in our revival, I think, that it might be fun to. But that's all. What did you wear? What did you wear? That's part of the fun. Yeah. But thank you very much. That's it. <laughs>
one more slide that I meant to add on, but it wasn't on my list of slides, so I completely forgot about it. But it was my final quote, and it's from Alan Jabua, and he, said, and he was working with traditional musicians in the States. And he said, based on many interviews and conversations, I would say that local musicians themselves judge non-local musicians principally on who they learn from and how well, not on their family name and birthplace. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's very interesting. It's not to do with how Irish you are, mm -hmm. whether your mother was Irish, whether you were born in, in, in Waxford or whatever. It's to do with your lineage, mm -hmm. what I started with. It's, it's how you apply yourself, what you learn from, what you take from the tradition into yourself. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was interesting for all of us, because there's so many non Irish people. That's the handbook of music revival. Yeah. Huh? So I thought that was a fascinating little, little throwaway comment <coughs> in his study of the Appalachian traditions. Okay. We need a cohort of people in this country to, to lay the foundation as well as others that are coming from outside. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that really is the end.